Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is Salvation by Grace. It's so wonderful to know that God accepts us exactly as we are because He's found a way of dealing with our sin. You know, so many religions teach that you have to do something, you have to live a certain way before God will accept you. And that's really a doctrine of hopelessness because we would never ever be good enough to be accepted by God in our own righteousness. Why? Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in His sight. There is no way that amount of doing good in our lives could compensate or even eradicate the evil that we have done. Sin must be judged and sin must be punished and it has been judged and has been punished in Christ. Freely and voluntarily Jesus made Himself the substitute sacrifice for our sins. And the Bible says the Lord laid on Him the iniquity of us all. God Himself provided a sacrifice and that sacrifice is in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ, so that His justice and His love could be fully satisfied. Now when some people talk about God's justice and God's love, they talk about these things as if they were two opposing attributes of God. In other words, they say on the one hand, God is just, but on the other hand, He is loving. And they make it as if God has some kind of dilemma in Himself, saying, well, how can I satisfy my justice and my love? But I want to tell you that God is one. There's no contradiction in God. His justice and His love are forever joined together because in His love He is just and fair and in His justice He is loving. The only issue is who is going to pay the price of sin and we know that if we were to pay it, we'd be lost forever. We can't pay it. Jesus has paid it for us. And so at the cross we understand the relationship between God's justice and His love. Since Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, God can no longer be accused of condoning evil of, or of being unjust because His justice in judging and punishing sins has once for all been clearly and convincingly revealed to creation. And it's all of this, of course, builds up to the greatest revelation of the cross, which is God's love. Until the cross, it was not apparent that God was this great God of love. Not everybody could grasp the love of God, but when the cross came, everybody now can grasp His love. Disease, disasters, decay, even death, all these things argued against God being characterized by love. I know there were many evidences of God's love in the Old Testament, but somehow there was still not that clear, unambiguous manifestation of God's love that we see at the cross. Tragedy, torture, tyranny, and tribulation all seemed irreconcilable with a God of love. But at the cross, God finally revealed to humanity the extent of His immeasurable, inexhaustible, unknowable, self-giving love. And so the New Testament always describes God's love in terms of the sacrifice at the cross. We see this particularly in 1 John. Turn to 1 John and chapter 4. And uh, verses 7 to 21 is the full passage, but especially verses 9 and 10. Let's read those ones. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And again, John 1 uh, 
1 John chapter 3 and verse 16. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought also to love the brethren. We would not know love at all if there had been no cross, if there had been no Calvary. Now, that's a very strange thing, because we know God's love is revealed in all of creation. But the truth is, this world doesn't reflect who God is in every detail. This is a fallen world. And it's still a stumbling block for many people today. It's not just an Old Testament problem. People today will say, I can't understand you talking about God being a God of love. How can you say God's a God of love? And look what's happened to me. My life is in a mess. I'm suffering. I've got this pain, this sickness. And they talk about the tragedies that have hit their life. But love is not measured by your circumstances. Love is measured by what God has done for every single one of us in sending Jesus to die upon the cross. Now, all of us experience something of God's love in this life. But the Bible claims that there is only one act of pure selfless love which has been unattained by, which has been untainted by any ulterior motive, and that is the death of Jesus Christ, the self-giving of God in Christ on the cross for undeserving sinners. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 is another clear passage about this. God demonstrates his own love toward us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This tells us that God's love shown at the cross is revealed in three distinct aspects. First of all, God gave his son. This is God's son that is given. And God gave his son to die on the cross. It's not just that God gave his son, say, okay, you can have a look at him, you can see his glory, and he'll just say a few nice words, then go back to heaven, a day trip to earth. No, he gave his son to live on this earth and to die. And then it says he gave his son to die for us. For who? For us. For us, his sinful, ungodly, powerless enemies. What is quite powerful about this verse is to think about it in its historical setting. Romans 5 verse 8 was written by, in the generation of those people who could remember that while Jesus was dying on the cross, they were living a life of sin. So Paul says, this is how God demonstrates his own love toward us. While we were yet sinners, while I was sinning, Jesus was dying, Paul says. Now for us, we have to go back and say, even before we were born, Jesus died for us. That's how strong his love is, and I think that's an even stronger manifestation of God's love. To look to, to the time when he would see the day that Colin die would be born on this earth, and he would know in his omniscience all the sins that Colin die would ever commit from the moment he was born right up until the very end, and yet God still sent Jesus to die for that Colin die. Happens to be this Colin die too, but, that, but how about you? It's the, same, it's the same with you. At the cross, stretched by soldiers between two thieves, the son died and the father left him alone. Why? Because of their love for the thieves, because of their love for the torturers, and because of his love, their love, for all those who pleaded for the son's death. That's the only thing that took him there. It was the love of God. Now at the cross, God gave everything because of his love for those who deserve nothing. The Father gave the Son for those who prefer to worship other gods, and the Son gave himself for those who steadfastly ignore him. They both surrendered their relationship with each other because of their unimaginable love for the whole world and for every member of humanity. Since the dreadful agony and divine separation of the sacrifice at Calvary, nobody can look at the cross and question God's love because nothing could demonstrate God's love more clearly than this total selfless, self-sacrificial death. So here is the revelation of God's justice and love, and this is why the cross is the basis of our lives as believers, that we are to imitate this sacrifice, to imitate this love, and to walk in the path that Jesus took. And so we must see our lives in that light. But also at the cross, we find the glory of God revealed through his divine wisdom and power. The first 11 chapters of God, uh, Paul's letter to Romans are a description of Paul's gospel. In these chapters, 
Paul describes how God presented Christ as a substitute sacrifice, how he justifies us through faith in Christ, and how he starts to transform us by the work of his Spirit and is shaping us into a new community in which we are to be admitted on the same condition and terms as the Jews by faith. But before Paul goes on to apply these principles to the life in practice as a believer, the practical outworking of this, he pauses for a moment's reflection. And in Romans 11, verses 33 to 36, he praises the ingenious wisdom which devised salvation in such a way that it simultaneously meets all the needs of both humanity and God's self-consistent nature. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him and it should be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. And so... The early chapters of Romans stress the revelation of the cross, bringing God's manifestation of justice and love. And now, he says, the cross also reveals God's perfect wisdom. God's wisdom, the opposite of human wisdom, a very strong theme of the Apostle Paul's. In the book of Corinthians, he stresses there that the cross reveals God's wisdom and power. And the wisdom and power of God is opposite to the wisdom and power of man. In Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21, it says, The Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. Uh, now here, the Jews were laying down different conditions from the Gentiles, but they were both demanding something to demonstrate the reality of who God was. They both wanted to see the gospel message prove its authenticity by its own inherent power and wisdom. Show us the power of this thing. Show us the wisdom of this thing. But they weren't asking spiritual questions. They were judging wisdom by human wisdom. They were judging power by human power. And it's interesting how in the next verse, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 23, Paul turns it on its head and he says, But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. You Jews, you want to see power. Where is the power of this thing? You Greeks want to ask, where's the wisdom of this thing? But we don't preach human wisdom or human power. We preach Christ crucified, which is a stumbling block to the Jews. It's the essence of weakness, and it is a foolishness to the Gentiles. It's the essence of human folly. And it's these very things that reverse the human standards and show us that salvation is not of human beings. It's not of man. It comes from God. It's salvation by grace. It comes from above. It's nothing whatsoever to do with our thinking, our ingenuity, our power, our passion, our wisdom, or our understanding. The cross is the exact opposite of these things. Christ is crucified in weakness, but the weakness at the cross is actually the power of God. And the folly of the cross is the wisdom of God. Have a look at the next verses. Verse 24. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Friends, we have to grasp this and lay hold of it because it should determine who we are as believers and how we should live. We must not follow the way of the world's wisdom. We must not follow the way of the world's power. We must not utilize the world's systems and the world's methods in our preaching of the gospel and in our proclamation of who Jesus is. We must depend entirely upon the power of God to bring conviction concerning people's sins. We must depend entirely upon the revelation of the Holy Spirit who will whisper God's wisdom and share his divine secrets with those who will believe the gospel message. So that our lives are transformed. This shows for us the absolute essential nature of regeneration. It's not human ability that gets us saved. We need the power of God to quicken us and to bring us to that point where we acknowledge who Jesus Christ is. This means that, through the, that though the cross appears to most people as the height of impotence and folly, it is actually the supreme manifestation of God's personal wisdom and power. Can you see how God turns it right round? The very thing that every single one of us would say is weakness and uh, foolishness. 
is God's wisdom and power. And even today, people say, oh, this, this message of the cross is stupid. That you expect me to believe that 2,000 years ago, some Galilean preacher who got into trouble with the legal system of his day, good man that he was, rejected by his own people, that something had happened to this man, his blood, 2,000 years ago, has power to get me to heaven? Nonsense, they say. And it is foolishness to the human mind. But we don't reason according to the human mind. We reason with the mind of Christ and with the Holy Spirit. So God, now, to demonstrate this principle, continues to choose the foolish and the feeble, to shame the wise and the strong. If you don't believe me, just look around this room. Go and look in this direction too. God chooses the foolish and feeble to shame the wise and the strong. And he does this in order to exclude any possibility of human boasting. Hallelujah. We, we glory, we glory in Christ. It is entirely God. Our salvation is 100% God's work. It's not partly God and partly us. And you say, but we have to cooperate. Of course we do. But the condition is believing him. And believing him is simply accepting and acknowledging all that he has done and receiving that finished work of salvation for your life. And so Paul continues to underline the multifaceted nature of salvation by summarizing the cross as a grace gift by bringing four great blessings into our lives. God's personal wisdom, God's personal righteousness, God's sanctification, and redemption. God's wisdom. Now, the Old Testament builds up a very strong picture of God's wisdom. It relates in the book of Job and Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon. It relates to something very special in God. Now, these important sections of the Bible, particularly in Proverbs, personify wisdom contrasting her with folly, the refusal to know or to acknowledge God. That's what folly is. That's what foolishness is. And these chapters, Proverbs 1 to chapter 9 in particular, contain a remarkable series of claims and promises which are fulfilled and repeated by the Word in John's Gospel. Let's just take one example. Proverbs chapter 7, Proverbs chapter 8, I beg your pardon, verses 32 to 35. Now listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise, and do not disdain it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors, for whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. Doesn't that sound like Jesus? Come to me and I'll give you life. Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the wisdom of God. And so the Apostle Paul, from his own personal experience at his preaching in Corinth, remembers that it came through wisdom and power, the wisdom and power of God. He says that he did not visit Corinth in his own strength or with a message of human wisdom. Instead, he brought the apparently foolish message of the cross, and he had gone in weakness, in fear and trembling, relying on the Holy Spirit to confirm his words and convince God's people of their truth. So the Apostle Paul, who had as much rhetoric in his little finger that it could convince crowds of anything he wanted to convince them, he said, I will not use these worldly systems of philosophy. I won't convince you with my own powers of persuasion. I will depend upon the Holy Ghost to convince you that Christ is alive and this is the wisdom of God. He said, the purpose of this is that you may know that your faith does not rest on the wisdom of man or the fellow with the clever argument. If people are convinced by a clever argument, they'll be convinced as long as that argument holds until somebody else comes and puts a better one forward. But if you are convinced by the power of God and by the wisdom of God, you will believe him no matter what people say. Your faith rests not on uh, with human wisdom, or human ideas, or human abilities. Your faith rests firmly on God's personal power, what he's done in your life. 
This shows once more the utter necessity of the new birth and the fallacy of depending upon intellectual persuasion or even moral persuasion or even emotional persuasion. We must make sure in our life and ministry that we are seeing genuine Holy Ghost conversions. People are being persuaded by God. They're being convicted by the Spirit of God. They're being convinced by the wisdom of God. Not because they're going along with the crowd. They're following the latest evangelical charismatic bandwagon down to some cul-de-sac. No, what they are doing is seeking the face of God and they know that God's in your life. And I want to say to you, some of you who are training for Christian ministry at all over the world, you need to know this, that God has got a hold of your life and that you are saved by His grace and the power of God has transformed you and even though you have faced a firing squad, you're not going to give in because Jesus is your Lord. He's changed your life. And even if you are facing the greatest intellectual argument in the day and generation and you are sharing the folly and foolishness of human experience as far as they are concerned, you have the wisdom of God and God will put His Word in your mouth because you are born again by the Holy Ghost. You haven't joined a club. You've been born again. Now, the message of the cross will never be humanly popular apart from when God convinces people of it because God has chosen to reveal His wisdom power through human foolishness and weakness. And so the cross shows that God's great wisdom in changing, in saving sinners and satisfying His love and His justice. Romans 1 verse 16 therefore declares that the cross is also the revelation of God's power for all who believe, the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. This means we can see God's justice and love and wisdom and power when we look at the cross. It's easy to emphasize in doing this one aspect of God's character more than another. We can be so taken by God's justice in dealing with our sin that we neglect the love which bore the judgment in the first place. And we can be so thrilled with the power that comes from the cross that we can overlook the wisdom which devised our salvation. And then at the cross we see the manifestation of the glory of God through perfect human goodness. When Jesus came, He came to show not only what God was like, but to show what humanity was meant to be like. And so Jesus came to live this life, to show us humanity in all its glory as God intended it to be. The visible glory of God was that which Jesus, it says in Philippians 2, refused to strive after or to hold on to, but instead he emptied himself of every attribute and visibly expressed God's nature. And he expressed that nature in humanity. And as a result of that, in that human form, Jesus lived the life of the ideal human being, as man, man, as God intended man to be. He sacrificed the public treatment that could have come to him because he was the Son of God, and the honor due to him because he was God in the flesh. And then he assumed the condition of a human slave and made himself nothing in human eyes. This was the visible self-denial of Jesus in that he accepted a life which began as that vulnerable, feeble fetus in a female womb, as a helpless babe in Bethlehem, as a powerless refugee in Egypt, as an illegitimate child, or so they thought, in Nazareth, as a humble carpenter in Galilee, as a homeless wanderer throughout Israel, and as a convicted criminal at Calvary, and so on and on and on. This was the self-denying, self-effacing way of living that Jesus freely chose for he deliberately sacrificed his visible glory to em embrace the supposed lowest levels of humanity. And he calls us to follow him. Let this mind that was in Christ Jesus be also in you. And so we find here that through a deliberate act of self-denial, Jesus chose to personify perfect human commitment with obscurity, powerlessness, indifference, and apparent insignificance and doing all of this with a spirit of contentedness. Oh yes, when it came to be baptized, Jesus joined the queue of sinners. When it came to give to people, he denied himself in the temptations in the wilderness. 
Oh, yes, he is Isaiah's suffering servant. Yes, he is the Son of Man, the heavenly Son of Man, that would come and receive glory, but in the first instance, he became the suffering Son of Man to live and to serve and to give his life for other people. And so God's ideal way in which he calls us to live is characterized by selfless, self-giving, self-sacrificial, self-denial. And all of this reaches its highest climax in the human being, through the cross. Here we have humanity raised to the highest level of human dignity and the example of what God called us to be like in the self-giving of Jesus at the cross. And it should be obvious, therefore, that the willing acceptance of the cross of Jesus Christ is the only natural conclusion that would, li- that would meet, that would come, the only natural conclusion of a life lived totally in self-sacrifice. Oh, yes, He is the willing, self-sacrificial servant of the Lord. And though the cross was anathema to the disciples, God's ideal way surely was not suffering, rejection, and death, but Jesus said, yes, it is. I must do this. And as the ultimate sacrifice drew near, Jesus continued to teach them about the secret of human greatness. Take up your cross and follow me. He demonstrates the unpretentious, peaceful nature of his life. He commends the widow's discreet sacrifice. He applauds Mary's extravagant giving. He reveals the perfection of his love and instructed his disciples to follow his example. All this was the build-up to his willing self-sacrifice at the cross, and he says it's the secret of fruitfulness in your life. And so Jesus took this principle to himself, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it, ad- if it dies, it will bring forth much fruit. And even at the cross, we have the ideal man making, making provision for his mother, forgiving those who crucified him. Here he is, serving God to the very last moment, committing his, ha- his spirit into the hands of the Father, trusting the Father to the very end. And so we have the ideal suffering servant of the Lord that Isaiah spoke about, fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ and supremely, supremely manifested at the cross. That is the glory of God, and it's by that glory you have been saved. God bless you at the end of this session till we come back to the next one. Amen.